Damos continuidad al programa del día de hoy. Y les contamos que desde un enfoque de construcción de conocimiento comunitario y un marco de investigación-acción participativa, se ha estructurado este foro internacional con seis paneles y dos presentaciones, de la mano de experimentadas y experimentados moderadores, panelistas y expositores, se busca lograr los siguientes objetivos. El primero de ellos es promover la visibilidad y contribución de los profesionales LGBTIQ+, dentro de la industria marítima. También fortalecer el acceso y el desarrollo profesional de las personas LGBTIQ+, dentro de la industria marítima. IXISTU también busca impulsar marcos de acción para el establecimiento de políticas inclusivas que garanticen la protección de las personas LGBTIQ+, dentro de la industria marítima. Y finalmente, se desea promover la innovación, el desarrollo y el crecimiento continuo de la industria marítima a través de una participación diversa, inclusiva y respetuosa del talento humano. Vamos a dar inicio entonces al primer panel de este foro titulado Equal Rights Coalition. El objetivo de este panel es compartir el marco de acción y estructura de trabajo de esta coalición, al igual que casos de éxito implementados por los Estados miembros, promoviendo la protección de los derechos de la población LGBT+, desde una perspectiva multidimensional e intersectorial. La moderadora de este panel es la señora María Gabriela Frías. Les contaré un poco de ella. María Gabriela es licenciada en psicología. Ella cuenta con más de 10 años de experiencia como productora audiovisual. Desde el 2017 es activista de los derechos humanos con la Fundación Convive Panamá, en la que comenzó como voluntaria y más tarde ocupó la dirección del programa Hacer Comunidad encargada, entre otras responsabilidades, de la delegación participante en la Marcha del Orgullo. Luego de fungir como Project Manager en la Fundación Convive Panamá, es nombrada directora y coordinadora del programa y red empresarial Pride Connection Panamá y consultora en diversidad, equidad e inclusión. Con un cálido aplauso recibimos a la moderadora de este panel, la señora María Gabriela Frías. Oops. Dear participants, uy. Dear participants and distinguished guests, it is an honor to welcome you to this panel on the Equal Rights Coalition organized by the IXIS2 Forum of 2023. For this panel, we will be joined by representatives from the embassies of the United States, Canada, Mexico, and Germany, countries committed to the promotion and protection of human rights in all of their forms. Our main objective is to address the challenges faced by the LGBTQ plus people in various sectors, with a special focus on the maritime field. We recognize that the discrimination, violence, and lack of legal protection remain significant obstacles in the struggle for equality and dignity for all people, regardless of sexual orientation, gender expression, and gender identity. We sincerely appreciate the participation of each of you and hope that this panel will be an enriching space for the exchange of ideas, experiences, and innovative solutions. Together, we can create a world where all people, regardless of sexual orientations, gender expression, and gender identity, live free from discrimination and enjoy the full protection of their fundamental rights. Welcome and thank you for being agents of change. My name is Maria Gabriela Frias, Chief Program Officer and Project Manager for Fundación Convive Panama, and I'll be moderating this panel. It is an honor to share this space together with Barry Brisman, Nathan Eckstein, Santiago Mateo Cibrian, and Frank Meyer. Please welcome them with an applause.
cool. Okay, so Barry. Um, he has been first secretary, political, of the Canadian Embassy in Panama since July 2021, having previously held the position of head of political program in Trinidad and Tobago and Bangladesh. He was also a member of the Canadian delegation to the UN, serving on the fourth committee of the General Assembly in 2012, and was an election observer in Guyana in 2011. Barry has also worked for Global Affairs Canada on countering violent extremism and in bilateral relations with Peru and the Caribbean. Barry holds a BA and MA in history from the University of Calgary and did postgraduate studies in political science at Tel Aviv University. Nathan Eckstein is the human rights officer at the U.S. Embassy in Panama. He has been in the U.S. Foreign Service since 2021. Before that, Nathan worked as a fellow in the office under, of the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. A native of Chicago, Nathan has an AB and MPA from Princeton University School of Public Affairs and International Affairs. Frank Meyer, born in Germany in 1959, diplomat and connoisseur of history and the English language. In 1988, he entered the Diplomatic Academy in Bonn, Germany, and from there he has held diplomatic posts in the embassies of Abdian, London, Santiago de Chile, Kigali, Tallinn, and Harare. He has worked with the German Foreign Office at the Bonn and Berlin offices. He currently works as deputy head of the German embassy in Panama. Santiago Mateo Cibrian. He graduated with a degree in international relations from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México and holds a master's degree in Asian and African studies with a specialization in Japanese studies from El Colegio de México. He has been a career member of the Mexican Foreign Service since 1993, 30 years now as a diplomat. Congratulations. <laughs> He arrived in Panama in 2018 as head of the Chancery and since May 2022 is the Chargé d'Affaires at Interim of the Embassy. Welcome. We will start now with Frank Meyer from the German Embassy. Yes, thank you very much for your kind, kind introduction and um, if you allow I will also speak English because I feel a little bit more at ease in, in the language. Um, thank you very much for giving us that opportunity uh, this morning to present the Equal Rights Coalition. Uh, we all form part of it, uh, the countries being here. And of course there are many, many countries more uh, um, being member of this coalition. And I have the honor to uh, share this presentation, which will hopefully appear on the screen, uh, with my uh, dear colleague from the Mexican Embassy, because uh, Germany and Mexico uh, right now have the co-chair of the Equal Rights Coalition. So I will start with a sort of uh, a brief introduction into the structure, the mission, the vision and the general objectives, and then Santiago will carry on with a sort of more detailed approach on, on the objectives. Uh, so, so this should, uh, yeah, so this will be the, the sort of structure of my presentation. We'll give you a brief general information then about the vision, mission, objectives, and the uh, uh, the sort of program of the co-chairs of, of uh, Mexico and Germany on the Equal Rights Coalition. Uh, so let's start with the, with the general outlook on Equal Rights Coalition. What is Equal Rights Coalition? Equal Rights Coalition is, is, uh, um, was founded in uh, 2016. It's an intergovernmental organism which has right now 42 member states and uh, also more than 140 NGOs. It's a, a mixture of countries from, from the north and from the global south and, and civil society institutions. Um, the working languages are English and Spanish and Germany is has also been one of the founding members of the Equal Rights Coalition 
and we took over with Mexico the co-chair in uh, 2022. Before that, uh, the co-chair uh, was assumed by the United Kingdom and Argentina. Uh, ERC promotes and protects uh, the human rights of the uh, LGBT, uh, LGBT LGTBIQ plus in German it's different, so then that's why sometimes I have more problem with spelling. Um, and we support the, uh, the development, inclusive uh, the inclusive uh, development, as well in the member states of the Equal Rights Coalition, uh, but also in, in in countries which are not member states of the Equal Rights Coalition, uh, working together with organisations of the civil society, multilateral organizations, and activists from all over the world. Uh, the work of the Equal Rights Coalition uh, is divided in, in, in four working groups. So we have, for example, one working group on international diplomacy, one on donor coordination, uh, the third on national laws and policies, and the fourth one on um, sustainable development goals and agenda 2030. And each working group again is headed by one member state and one civil society uh, actor. So we have two working groups which are headed by the, um, by the Netherlands and one by the UK. The third is, is actually right now vacant. Um, but we also always try in Equal Rights Coalition to find uh, membership and leadership by both uh, representatives from the countries, but also from the from the community. Uh, the groups meet uh, on a monthly basis um, right now, and given the diversity of the membership, it's done in in virtual member. Uh, manner and uh, trying to advance the strategic objectives of the coalition uh, and uh, and uh, uh, organizing sessions on on priority topics um, that involve the member states uh, and the the key subjects. So this is a bit of the the structure of the Equal Rights Coalition. Uh, we all know that discrimination based on, on gender and sexual or, uh, orientation exists in all member states, in all societies. Uh, these, by the way, are the first words of our inclusion concept that we adopted in 2021 in Germany. So this is a fact um, that we cannot deny and that we shouldn't deny. And I think this is the basis for the vision of the Equal Rights Coalition, which works uh, for, word, uh, for world in where all nations recognize and, oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, uh, where all nations uh, <laughs> recognize and, and protect the rights, uh, the human rights of, of the lesbian, gay, trans, bisexual, and intersectional community. And we try to, uh, maintain and, and make sure that all the world uh, can participate in all these aspects of, of life, free of discrimination, violence, independently of uh, sexual orientation, identity, or expression of, of gender or sexual characteristics. So this is the, the, the global vision of, of ERC. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, again, the mission, as I've quoted, is an intergovernmental uh, institution, coalition, uh, a coalition, and that is also important, which does not try to duplicate work that has already been done in other quarters, but it's a coalition, it's an organization that tries to complement the work uh, that has been done by other groups uh, in other countries, uh, in other circles. Um, and all the member states of the Equal Rights Coalition, uh, when they become member, they, they pledge to uh, 
work together to implement the goals of the of the uh, coalition. So a few words on the general objectives of the equal rights coalition. Uh, one, of course, is to defend the equality uh, of rights for all people. Uh, second is uh, to share information on good practices within the member states of the ERC uh, and how to promote the human rights of the LGBTIQ plus uh, persons and uh, to, to support the uh, um, development um, of these groups. Uh, this happens, of course, on, on a capital-based approach of the working groups that I mentioned, uh, but also in the work of local ERC groups. And uh, as probably all of you know, we have uh, a very active ERC group. And in that respect, I would like to thank very much my, my colleagues from uh, the Netherlands, who are not on the panel, but also from the United States, from, from Canada, from the UK who have been very active in the past. Uh, I have to frankly say much more active than we uh, because we are a very small embassy, but uh, we try to learn from them and, and do our part. And uh, once again, I also like to take this opportunity to thank them because these local groups, of course, are very important to share information uh, on the situation on the ground, which we as embassy then try to feed back into our system in, in, in the capital. So this is a very important point. Uh, third one is building bridges, establishing points of uh, common points and uh, participate in a spirit of dialogue and open cooperation. Uh, then briefly, next, next slide. Uh, to study measures necessary to protect and promote these rights, uh, uh, working closely in, in close cooperation with all interested parties, uh, coordinate diplomatic actions uh, jointly and at all uh, levels. So ERC is also sort of coordination uh, group for efforts going on in the United Nations in other fora. So. Um, but again, not to duplicate things, but to complement things. So ERC, I think, also feeds in to the respective groups that we are all members in the United Nations. Um, and uh, of course, uh, ERC has also a, a, a financial uh, aspect uh, which aims to promote initiatives of, of uh, groups and um, ERC members to undertake reforms um, on national level uh, to improve the human rights of the LGBTIQ uh, group all over the world. So this is uh, basically my General introduction. Now I would uh, hand over to my colleague from the Mexican Embassy to go into more details on our working program and the more specific objective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. We now go with uh, Ministro Santiago Mateo Sirian. Um, Gracias, Gaby. Muy buenos días a todos. Gracias por la invitación a los patrocinadores del evento. Eh, bueno, continuando, perdón, I don't speak in Spanish because it's my language. Parte del proceso que tenemos los países de la coalición para igual de derechos es mantener un diálogo constante con todos los países y sobre todo visibilizar este problema que tenemos, no solamente eh, en algunas regiones, sino a nivel internacional, de manera global. Es por eso que el objetivo que tenemos en los 42 países que participamos como miembros, es buscar alcanzar la igualdad por la, eh, por la comunidad LGBTIQ+. Dentro de este proceso, como bien lo dijo Frank, tenemos eh, eh, unos objetivos muy claros, muy precisos. Ya los ya conocer, los objetivos generales que perseguimos como coalición, pero ahora quisiera yo hablarles sobre los objetivos estratégicos 
que tenemos a futuro en los próximos cinco años. En primer lugar, tenemos eh, contribuir a poner fin a las leyes y políticas que discriminan a las personas LGTBIQ+, incluyendo su criminalización. El objetivo de esto es tratar de radicalizar, o, perdón, erradicar completamente la criminalización de, la, de las personas eh, LGBTIQ+, que se encuentran en algunos países, principalmente en aquellos países donde todavía se mantiene este estigma contra, contra la comunidad. En segundo lugar, contribuir a la eliminación de la violencia y la discriminación basadas en la orientación sexual, la identidad de género, la expresión de género y las características sexuales. Tercero, impulsar la aplicación y seguimiento de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible para la inclusión de las personas LGBTIQ+. Eso significa, como bien se dijo al principio, eh, la, la necesidad de mantener como parte de los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible eh, la necesidad de, de luchar por la, por la comunidad no solamente a nivel de, 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 de promoción de sus derechos, sino más allá, que sean incluidos dentro de los objetivos de desarrollo y sobre todo que estén plenamente con, eh, relacionados con ellos. En, y en cuarto lugar, ampliar y desarrollar la capacidad de la coalición de derechos por la igualdad. La presidencia está compuesta por dos países. Como bien lo dijo Frank, tenemos actualmente a México y Alemania que presidimos la, la presidencia de la coalición. Anteriormente era Argentina y Reino Unido. En esta nueva presidencia, conformada por 42 estados, eh, el mandato es por dos años y dentro de este mandato tenemos la necesidad de, de mantener una participación activa de los países. Para este periodo, México y Alemania han tenido una serie de compromisos que los vamos a, continuar, los vamos a, a, a mencionar a continuación. Son cinco compromisos. El, siguiente, por favor. El primer compromiso es que Alemania y México, como presidentes, promoverán la plena implementación de la estrategia global de la coalición por la igualdad de derechos y el pleno cumplimiento del plan quinquenal de implementación 21-26 vigente. Esto con el objetivo de alcanzar la igualdad de la comunidad LGTBIQ+. Eh, este objetivo, eh, como bien lo dijo Frank, tenemos, eh, lo realizamos a través de cinco grupos de trabajo, un, eh, copresididos por los diferentes países que conforman la, la coalición. Segundo, para fortalecer aún más la institucionalización de la coalición por la igualdad de derechos, es voluntad de Alemania y México establecer una secretaría que funcione como unidad administrativa. La próxima conferencia bianual de la coalición con el apoyo de Alemana tendrá lugar en México. Esta secretaría busca de alguna manera tratar de coordinar e implementar las políticas que, y las estrategias que tenemos planeadas. En realidad la coalición, como bien saben ustedes, eh, es joven, nacimos en el 2016, así que es un trabajo constante el que estamos realizando, un trabajo que necesitamos coordinar y tener sobre todo un, un grupo supervisor. Es por eso que Alemania y México vamos a tratar de implementar esa secretaría. No sabemos todavía en qué términos, de qué manera, con qué mandatos, pero el objetivo es que tengamos una mayor eh, dirección de estrategias de la coalición de los 42 países. Y por último, eh, perdón, el tercero, es interés de Alemania y México apoyar los esfuerzos por aumentar la membresía y la participación activa de los estados y las organizaciones de la sociedad civil dentro de la coalición enfocándose en los países del sur global, que actualmente tienen menos representación a nivel estatal. Eh, este objetivo o este compromiso eh, es muy importante. Somos nada más 42 países en, el momento, en este momento, hay más de casi 200 países en el mundo. Necesitamos implementar, ampliar la participación de los demás países y sobre todo de las organizaciones no gubernamentales, que muchas de ellas eh, trabajan solas. El objetivo de nosotros es buscarlas, encontrarlas y visibilizarlas. Así que parte del trabajo que estamos realizando es llegar a esto. No solamente en, en, en la parte de, de, de le llamamos el, el norte global, que es donde hay mucha, activa, eh, mucha participación y muy activa. Necesitamos irnos urgentemente a los países del sur global, es decir, a los países en Latinoamérica, donde hay una muy baja participación. Eh, como cuarto punto tenemos 
que Alemania y México, la siguiente, por favor, a ver, es Alemania y México impulsarán los debates sobre las brechas situacionales de crisis que tienen un impacto en las personas LGBTQ+, en múltiples contextos de crisis en todo el mundo, iniciando alianzas con organizaciones que trabajan en este ámbito, entre otras medidas. Estas alianzas estratégicas que buscamos eh, es parte de los objetivos que realizamos, por ejemplo, en Panamá. Nuestro objetivo como coalición es tratar de buscar las eh, organizaciones que luchen con los mismos objetivos. Eh, parte del trabajo que, que estamos realizando eh, tiene una, una participación eh, muy activa, sobre todo a nivel de eh, embajadas. Nuestra participación en Panamá eh, trata de ser más activa, conociendo eh, que eh, Panamá eh, no pertenece a la coalición, tratamos de trabajar de manera eh, muy decisiva, con mucho tacto, es por eso que el 16 de marzo de, de este año publicamos un comunicado en favor de los derechos de la comunidad LGTBIQ+, que por cierto causó mucho escozor en las redes sociales, pero es parte de nuestro trabajo, de, parte de nuestro trabajo tratar de visibilizar esta problemática. Y finalmente, los desarrollos políticos y legislativos que amenazan los derechos humanos de las personas LGTBIQ+, en diferentes países, así como los casos individuales, deben continuar siendo discutidos y abordados dentro de la coalición con el fin de establecer posiciones claras. En ese sentido, la coalición responderá a los ataques antigénero, antiderechos y antidemocráticos contra las personas y comunidades LGTBIQ+. Eh, esto es parte del proceso, parte de la promoción de la igualdad de los derechos de las personas LGTBIQ+. Trataremos de utilizar todas las capacidades diplomáticas y de negociación que tenemos los países para conseguir este, este objetivo. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Vamos ahora con la presentación de Barry Brisbane. Muchas gracias a, a Maggie, a Gustavo, a, a todos los organizadores y voluntarios, estimados uh, colegas, uh, buen día a todos. Uh, Solo un aviso muy corto a los traductores, he cambiado el texto uh, un poco. Me encanta introducir un elemento inesperado a la conversación. Uh, I am pleased to be part of today's Equal Rights Coalition panel, along with my colleagues from Germany, Mexico, and the U.S. Canada was honored to be a co-chair recently of the ERC. As a Canadian civil servant, I am fortunate to have the space and the policy and legal protections to do my work and to represent my country as an openly gay man. There is no political party in Canada today at the provincial or federal levels with any seats that advocates the rolling back of LGBTQ plus rights. There is a national consensus that discrimination is wrong and that it harms all of us. The default assumption now is that those who discriminate against us are causing the problems, not us for simply being who we are. This does not mean that there aren't individual politicians who attempt to target us, only that they are kept far away from any meaningful influence or power in most cases. And discrimination still exists in our governments, but less so and with the laws and workplace policies favoring us. I don't have time to cover the entire history of the advancement of the LGBTQ rights movement in Canada, but I will mention some salient points for context. In 1969, homosexuality was decriminalized in Canada, but persecution continued. It was only in 1995 that our Supreme Court prohibited discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation after some provinces had already made that change, starting with Quebec in 1977. In 2005, after several provinces had already done so, the federal government made equal marriage the law across Canada. Protection against discrimination on the basis of gender identity only came in 2017. I would like to present three core principles of activism that are necessary to promote LGBTQ plus rights. The first is that we must always remember that rights are taken, they are not granted. What do I mean by that? I mean that no one, no institution in particular, <clears throat> will give you rights that you have not demanded for yourself. Rights are only gained through work, through education, and through battle. 
The second principle is that vigilance is always required. Never think of gains as permanent or as untouchable. We are seeing this right now in Nathan's country where there has been a tremendous backlash against LGBTQ plus rights and their efforts to entrench discrimination in law. Laws matter and politicians are the ones who pass laws. So being involved politically is part of the work of being vigilant. The third principle is that allies are indispensable. Solidarity matters. People from marginalized and vulnerable groups must share each other's struggles. If you have a problem, I have a problem. These principles are based not only on our community's experiences, but on those of others, particularly women. Without the women's movement, there would have been no LGBTQ plus movement and no queer rights. To a patriarchal heteronormative system, women and LGBTQ plus people represent the same challenge. We meet the same resistance from power structures that favor a certain caricature of masculinity as the only valid expression of power and of leadership in most of the world. The labor movement is in the vanguard of advocacy on behalf of LGBTQ plus people in Canada, though it has not always been so. There were bitter struggles within unions over LGBTQ plus rights. It is interesting to note, however, that gay liberation activists in Canada in the 1960s and 70s learned to organize from the trade union movement and from left-wing parties. In recent decades, public and private sector unions in Canada have taken the lead in educating their members, working to prevent workplace discrimination and violence, ensuring that collective agreements recognized LGBTQ people and their loved ones as equals, and advocating for governmental policies promoting equality and prohibiting discrimination. Integrating LGBTQ plus rights was more common at first uh, in the 1970s and 80s, and even later among public sector unions. I believe that this was at least in part due to higher female membership in many of those unions. Among the earlier private sector union champions were activists in the Canadian Auto Workers Union, now called Unifor, many of whom were involved in political movements where LGBTQ plus rights were already current areas of focus. I want to cite some material from the maritime sector as well. In 2019, the Canadian government, the International Longshore and Warehouse Union Canada, and the BC Maritime Employers Association announced a $4 million program on workplace harassment and violence prevention for the British Columbia waterfront. This included an emphasis on supporting populations at risk of experiencing workplace harassment and violence, including LGBTQ plus people and indigenous communities. The Seafarers International Union, SIU of Canada, has been very generous in providing me some information on their work on behalf of their LGBTQ plus membership. They have noted that the union's constitution and national shipping rules outline the fundamental rights all members are entitled to and ensures that no person shall be excluded from membership or opportunities for employment through discrimination based on their sexual or non-conforming identity or orientation in addition to any other reason. They mentioned that the international maritime industry has come a long way in recent years to catch up to other sectors when it comes to addressing issues of equality, diversity, and inclusion on board vessels. The number of workers in the maritime industry who identify as LGBTQ plus is likely still very low, but improving as Canadian maritime unions make greater efforts to recruit and retrain, sorry, retain new entrants to the industry and to ensure that workplaces are more inclusive and safe places for all. Anti-harassment, anti-bullying, and anti-discrimination language are included in all SIU Canada collective agreements and members have access to grievance and complaint procedures handled by trained union officials able to assist them across Canada. So what work lies ahead? A lot, I must say. This includes education at all levels, reinforcement of protection for LGBTQ plus children in schools and at home, and a broader need for greater social recognition and acceptance of our rights and our legitimacy as full members of the societies in which we live. What I have just said applies particularly to trans people who continue to bear the brunt of discrimination among LGBTQ plus people. 
There is a general lack of public understanding, which I dare say extends into government, of who trans people are and the problems they face. In the labor movement, LGBTQ plus rights must continue to be integrated into, integrated into all aspects of activity and advocacy. This means, among other things, inclusion in governance and leadership. Within the maritime sector, the SIU in Canada is advocating for a number of changes, including specific protection of LGBTQ plus seafarers in the Maritime Labor Convention, or MLC. The union argues that a requirement for companies to protect seafarers from discrimination and harassment, both on board and when traveling through or visiting ports within different jurisdictions, with different laws and beliefs, should be enshrined in the MLC. This is vitally important as around one third of UN member states still criminalize same-sex consensual sex between adults, including several countries where the death penalty may be applied. In Canada, the majority of Canadian flag vessels and Canadian and permanent resident seafarers operate exclusively within the territorial waters of Canada and the US. While the MLC is incorporated into domestic legislation through the regulations enabled by the Canada Shipping Act, Canadian labor and human rights laws are also applicable to seafarers on board these vessels. The Government of Canada's recent ratification of the International Labor Organization's Convention 190 in January 2023 to address violence and harassment in the world of work is a very positive step forward as well. I will conclude by saying that we must continue to build more success stories and protect what we have achieved. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. I haven't heard um, your colleagues from both the German embassy and the Mexican embassy. I guess, Nathan, it's your turn now. <laughs> That's right, thank you. And I will just add a few things because my colleagues have been so comprehensive and clear about our commitment to human rights and LGBT human rights. Um, but I will just say, I think in the private sector, in a lot of ways, people show commitments and priorities uh, by, by giving money or by giving support. Uh, diplomats show commitment and priorities by showing up, uh, by giving time. And it's really uh, impressive to me to see such senior colleagues, uh, an ambassador here, an ambassador speaking on these issues because it's not just prioritizing human rights, but for us it's about within the human rights portfolio what we prioritize. And so the Equal Rights Coalition has been in many ways a forcing function for us to think about these issues within the human rights portfolio, which on top of that fits into a whole other set of priorities embassies have to think about uh, in Panama and in the world. Um, in the US, our embassies in every country globally uh, annually publish the Human Rights Report. Many of you here have probably read it. Um, for the LGBT community in Panama, many of you have contributed to it by speaking with me or by speaking with some of my colleagues. This is one way when being asked to give a case study um, with how we draw attention to and confer legitimacy uh, in terms of LGBT human rights. Um, I will highlight kind of two examples. Uh, one that the U.S. Embassy cared a lot about in 2020, for those that aren't from Panama, um, Panama instituted a gender-based uh, lockdown um, and then uh, quarantine instead of kind of days for women and days for men, uh, right following COVID and then for basically a year afterwards. This, as you can imagine, was exceptionally problematic and harmful for trans individuals, especially when their IDs did not reflect the gender that they identified with. Um, this is something we highlighted in the Human Rights Report in 2020, and it's something we worked closely with LGBT civil society, with the Panamanian government, and with our embassy colleagues to draw attention to. Two, to the point that the president of Panama responded um, to change and to work to improve the situation. This is not something that improved the situation permanently or actually fully for trans Panamanians, but it's one thing that I think I wanna highlight is how embassies can move the needle and try to draw attention to these issues. More recently, our 2022 Human Rights Report draws attention to the fact that the Panamanian police do not allow um, homosexuality or lesbianism in their forces. 
this is another thing that matters and something you think about when we're thinking about safety for LGBT individuals in a country. Um, I will say that f for those that have been in Panama as well, they know that in, in September of last year, Jessica Stern came. She's our US Special Envoy for LGBT Rights. Um, and she is an exceptional public servant and former activist for LGBT issues. She cares a lot about the Equal Rights Coalition and had been coming from an event in Argentina where I think uh, Mexico and Germany got their leadership during that conversation. And she, um, when speaking to embassies and when her office is talking to the US um, about U.S. embassies about what to do on these issues says we should think about two things, which I will conclude with. Um, one is to do no harm. That matters when you think about embassies in certain countries. It doesn't matter as much in Panama, but it does matter when the U.S. has to say something in Uganda, for example. You want to make sure that what you're going to do as embassies is not going to make a community more at risk um, than they were before. When I'm writing the human rights report, I don't want to write about who said what, especially in a country where that could be a danger to that person. Um, but the second one that's so important is nothing about us without us. Embassies can never be out in front of what civil society in a country wants. We get our cues from you. Um, and often we are being uh, more diplomatic and more politic than you guys are able to be and that's the restrictions we have to follow. But please keep knocking at our door and please keep telling us what the issues are. Because when civil society is pushing embassies to do more, we show up and we give our time. And I, I wanna give kudos to Panama Civil Society and LGBT members for doing this day in and day out. It's exceptionally impressive. Um, I will say also that we're here to listen. For me, the maritime industry is something another section covers in my embassy. So <laughs> I'm learning about labor unions, I'm learning about seafarers, and I also want to learn about what's going on as it relates to human rights, women's rights, and LGBT rights in, in that industry. So I'm looking forward to the conversation. I thank you so much uh, for your time and for the time of my colleagues. Thank you, Nathan. Voy a pedirles un fuerte aplauso a los colegas del día de hoy. So now, um, turning over to the Q&A section, if that's okay with you. Um, I would like to start with the first question um, to Barry. Why do you think it's important the formation of a human rights coalition for the LGBTQ plus community that is part of the maritime sector? Uh, thanks for the question, Maggie. Uh, I'll refer back to uh, some of the comments uh, I made during my remarks about the importance of solidarity and of creating linkages between various human rights uh, issues and uh, movements to, uh, to advance together because on an individual basis it's much more difficult uh, to, to achieve progress. And everybody has a role to play. Uh, you, you have people who are diplomats like us, who advocate internationally for certain principles and human rights. You have politicians who are responsible for um, a certain level of uh, national, sometimes international dialogue, and for passing laws uh, that advance rights. Civil society activists, uh, but um, it's it's part of uh, it's part of an ongoing conversation among all of these groups, and without a coalition, uh, it is very hard uh, to to get anywhere. So um, the the phrase "if you have a problem, I have a problem" is something that uh, uh, a veteran labor leader said to me many years ago uh, when uh, when we were having uh, some issues with our employer. And we were talking uh, at one point specifically about LGBTQ plus rights. And he said, I, you know, I'm not part of the community, but you're my brother in the movement. And if you have a problem, I have a problem. It's up to all of us to make sure that your rights are protected and respected. Um, and this is 
I would say, cross-cutting, not only across issues, but across employment sectors, across industries. It's important to learn from one, one another what works, what doesn't, uh, and where we all want to end up at the end of the day, which is uh, a situation where our rights are comprehensively protected and respected, uh, no matter where we work and no matter where we live. Thank you, Barry. Um, I would like to ask the German Mexican colleagues here, and also the US, what action frameworks can be promoted from the coalition with the aim of improving the experiences and rights of the LGBTQ plus population in the maritime sector? <laughs> I know it's a long question, sorry. Well, as I said, it, it, that's a difficult one. Uh, I think um, if we want to, to go into more details of, of that sector, that would be best fed in into the group system of, of the ERC, because uh, as I said, it, uh, ERC consists of different different working groups, and uh, I I've, I've got the feedback, for example, from uh, from my colleagues in the German Foreign Office that they're that they are happy to discuss uh, Panama as a country you know, during one of the next meetings, and I think uh, if we talk about sectors, I think that is also something that could be fed into the in, in, into the coalition, uh, but on the capital-based approach. I, I, I don't think uh, uh, that that we as diplomats here in Panama have the the knowledge and and, and the experience to. Uh, to proceed on, on that matter because, uh, I mean, most of us are generalists who, who just learn, and I also take it uh, that that we will learn a lot from this meeting here. Uh, but again, this is a, a topical issue that I think the ERC could address on uh, in one of these working groups that, that exist. What about Mexico and then we will the U.S.? Gracias, Gabi. El el tema es muy interesante, sobre todo porque eh, se puede considerar como un, un, un debate que nos puede llevar muchos, mucho tiempo. En el caso de la coalición, lo que se busca no solamente es eh, defender los derechos de la comunidad LGTBIQ+, sino va un poco más allá. Como lo hemos comentado, la, la coalición es pequeña todavía, 42 países, sin embargo, el, el objetivo es ampliarlo y tener la posibilidad de, de que la gente, sobre todo en, en todos los sectores, incluso el sector marítimo, conozcan, se informen de que hay un grupo, de que hay una organización, un mecanismo que lucha por los derechos de la comunidad. Eso es muy importante. El carácter informativo que tiene la coalición es ahorita un reto para nosotros. Necesitamos que se dé a conocer más allá de los países donde estamos acreditados. Aquí, por ejemplo, en Panamá, los cuatro países y, y otros más que participan en la coalición, vamos a conocer, promovemos lo que hacemos, más allá de lo que es el, 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 el respeto de los derechos humanos. Es importante tener un papel mucho más activo. Por eso es eh, importante que cuando se presenta alguna problemática, que se nos dé a conocer. Creo que todas las embajadas aquí tenemos, somos portavoces de esta, eh, de esta situación y podemos llegar en conjunto a tener una voz común. Gracias. Ya fue todo dicho. <risa> vale. Y una, una última pregunta eh, que quizás no estaba en la, en la lista acá, pero me gustaría un poco realizarla. Espero que no cree ningún conflicto diplomático. Eh, ¿Qué mensaje le podrían dar a ustedes, y sí me gustaría escucharlos a todos, le podrían dar a aquellos países, entre esos Panamá, que todavía no forma parte de la coalición de los derechos humanos. So, ¿Cuál sería eh, ese mensaje que ustedes podrían enviarle a los países que todavía no forman parte y que quizás eh, se podría beneficiar ¿no? de ser parte del, del RERC? So, los escucho.
Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll respond in English. Um, ideally, there would be uh, uh, no need for an ERC because these rights would be universally respected. Um, that is unfortunately not likely to happen anytime soon. Uh, so what we need uh, is, is more allies. We would definitely like to see more countries uh, join in and, and promote uh, human rights. Uh, I am not going to speak specifically to the cases of individual countries uh, beyond saying that uh, each country has the sovereign right to determine uh, how they will function in the international arena. I will say, however, that uh, every country, almost without exception, has signed um, a large number of international treaties and agreements that commit them explicitly to protect and promote the human rights of all the people who are within their borders. And I say that rather than saying citizens because those protections need to extend to people who are also residents and people who are migrants and people who are refugees as well. Uh, so, and LGBTQ uh, plus rights are part of that system. This is something that has been recognized in international agreements and international law repeatedly, despite the fact that there are those who would uh, choose to ignore that uh, or work against it. So we all have an obligation to work towards the advancement of LGBTQ plus rights and human rights in general. And I would encourage everyone to hold their governments accountable for fulfilling this responsibility. Thank you, Barry. Uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, there's no litmus test, obviously, for membership in the Equal Rights Coalition. Out of 42 countries, um, depending on how civil society looks at different metrics, not all 42 countries are hitting that metric. A really obvious one, for example, is same-sex marriage. It's not a requirement for membership, right? Actually, Mexico succeeded in, in same-sex marriage. just like in the US, where we want a strong civil society to be able to remind our own government how they should commit to the rights of individuals. We would hope that every ERC member has governments that keep the doors open for LGBT civil society and strive for advancement on those issues. Thank you, Nathan. Um, Mr. Santiago. Um, como país, uh Y, y bien lo, lo has dicho, ahí te, tenemos eh, la posibilidad de, de tener una participación en, como coalición no obligatoria. Eh, y al mismo tiempo de que no es obligatoria, tampoco es vinculante con los organismos, con los, eh, órganos legislativos y eh, locales. Es decir, eh, no es vinculante nuestra participación a algún eh, marco jurídico local por lo que todos los países pueden participar. El, el objetivo, yo creo que de la mayoría, si no de todos los países del mundo, es el respeto, buscar el respeto a los derechos humanos y el respeto a los derechos por la, por la comunidad LGTBIQ en el mundo, creo que es parte de unos derechos humanos más importantes. Eh, no tenemos eh, vinculan, eh, vinculancia en, esta, en, en este marco, 
por lo que todos los países pueden participar. Es por eso que nuestro objetivo es divulgar, promover lo que hacemos, eh, participar en las actividades que realizan los, eh, se realizan en los países en favor de la comunidad y es por eso que, por ejemplo, en los desfiles del orgullo, estamos teniendo una participación muy activa. El año pasado participamos en las embajadas que estamos aquí y este año también lo vamos a hacer. Excelente, gracias. Uh, Frank, I don't know if you would like to add something. Um, no, I mean, I think my, my colleagues mentioned, mentioned it all. I mean, the, the aim, as I'm as I said in my, my presentation, is to, to increase ERC membership, and uh, it's an open process, so every country can participate. But I would, would underline that by, by trying to join or by, uh, by, by joining, you have to subscribe to the principles. So uh, it's, it's not a membership for free. Uh, you have to subscribe to the principle of the Equal Rights Coalition. Um, and it has to be done by a sort of, uh, it's a silent procedure of the group, so the group also has to agree on, on, on new members. Um, but of course the aim is to, to expand the membership, to, to include many, many more countries, especially from the global south. Uh, I think there, there's still a lot to do, especially also with African countries who have uh, certain, certain challenges on, on, on that field. Um, and it, it's part of the, the whole picture of our, uh, of our support for, for human rights. Um, as Barry said, uh, I find that a very good saying. If it's, if it's your problem, it's my problem. I mean, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the, the leitmotif of, of all our work. I mean, you're not left alone. It's part of our human rights work. Uh, we mentioned that uh, in our human rights report. Uh, uh, we, we do the same exercise as the Americans do. Our reports are not public, but of course we report back to our capitals. Uh, we inform our visitors, our ministers, our members of parliament who come to this country about the situation of, of, of the community. Uh, so you're not left alone and uh, our doors are open and, and please uh, take these opportunities to, to talk to embassies because our job is to uh, to report back the image and uh, the rea rea reality on the ground to our decision makers in our capital. So that's, that would be my message. Yes. Thank you, Frank. And sadly, our time is over. Um, but I would like to, on behalf of all the, pan all the panelists and participants of this panel, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to all the attendees, the panelists, and the US, Canadian, Mexican, and German embassies for their valuable contribution to this discussion on the rights of LGBTQ plus people and the Equal Rights Coalition. Um, as committed participants and leaders, I urge you to take what you have learned today and continue to advocate for equal rights in your respective communities and countries. A commitment that Fundación Convive Panama has taken by being part of the Equal Rights Coalition civil society organizations. Together we can make a difference and create more just and inclusive societies where all people are treated with respect and dignity regardless of their sexual orientation, gender expression, or gender identity. I thank you once again for your active participation and dedication to this cause. Let us uh, continue to work to build a world where we can all live without fear for or discrimination and where the rights of LGBTQ plus people are fully recognized and protected. Thank you and let's keep moving forward on this important path of equality. Thank you. Gracias. Bien, agradecemos a todos los panelistas eh, y los invitamos a permanecer, por favor, en tarima. El comité organizador de esta conferencia desea hacer entrega de un reconocimiento a los miembros de este panel. Para ello, invitamos a, los voluntarios, a dos de los voluntarios de IXIS2, el señor César Araica y la señora Ingrid Araica. Al señor Frank Mayer. Al señor Barry Brisman.
al señor Nathan Eskistein. Al señor Santiago Mateo. Y a la señora María Gabriela Frías. Ahora les invitamos a todos a la fotografía oficial del panel, por favor, incluida la moderadora y los voluntarios. <risa> 